Steel plates stretch longer than a football field, taller than a five-story building, heavier than thousands of elephants. This massive structure was built on solid land, and somehow it has to move into the water for the first time. Not under its own power, but through gravity, balance and precision alone. Mind you, this could go really wrong. But why push an unfinished vessel into open water? Launching a ship doesn't mean it's ready to sail. It doesn't even mean it's complete. Usually, shipyards are not infinite. It is a high-demand infrastructure, and as soon as the hull is watertight, it has to make way for the next build. Sometimes the ship has no engines, or even the complete superstructure. Cabins might still be bare, the bridge still a hollow shell. And yet, this massive steel hull is pushed out into the sea. Here, launching isn't about operation, it's about displacement. For a few seconds, the entire weight of the vessel transfers from land-based supports to a fluid foundation. And in that moment, the ship must float and stay upright. How do you actually get this steel giant into the water? The answer depends on where it was built, how much space you have, and how much control you need. Some methods are bold, others are precise. The most famous method, the one you've probably seen in old newsreels, the end-on slide into the water. The champagne bottle shattering, the slow, majestic motion of steel meeting sea. But behind the tradition is physics. End-on launching, also called longitudinal launching, sends the ship sliding backward into the water using gravity. This isn't just some casual roll downhill. The launch must be timed and controlled. Because if the balance is wrong, if the supports shift, or if friction wins, the launch can stall, or worse, the hull can crack under its own weight. To prevent this, everything has to work in unison. It starts with a cradle, a heavy timber or steel frame that hugs the hull. The cradle sits on sliding ways which rest on greased groundways, all on a slipway, usually at an angle of about 1 in 20. That shallow slope is enough to trigger motion, but only if the numbers say it should. To find out if they do, engineers calculate two forces. First, the force pulling the ship down the ramp. F1 equals to P multiplied by sine alpha, where P is the total launching weight, ship plus cradle, and alpha is the slipway's angle. That's gravity's pull. Next is the force fighting against it friction. F2 equals to mu multiplied by P multiplied by cosine alpha, where mu is the friction coefficient between cradle and slipway. For the launch to work, gravity must win this tug of war. F1 must be greater than F2. To tilt the odds in favour of gravity, shipyards grease the ways with lime soap or mineral oil, keeping mu low, ideally between 0.015 and 0.03. But even that has limits. Too much pressure and the grease gets squeezed out. Too little and the ship just sits there. Some shipyards use steel rollers instead, replacing sliding friction with rolling friction. It's more expensive, but it's smoother. Now, here's something you don't see in the launch videos. That cradle, it isn't just a platform. It's a balancing act of pressure and distribution. If the poppets and supports don't match the curve of the hull exactly, the ship's weight, measured in meganewtons, gets concentrated on small contact points. The contact pressure under each sliding way must be checked to avoid overstressing the hull. Where sigma is constant pressure, P is the distributed load, and A is the area of support contact. Too high, and the shell plating can dent or buckle before it even hits the water. And that's not the only risk. During launch, as the stern enters the water and the bow still rests on land, the ship experiences severe bending stress. Depending on the trim and timing, the hull may sag, or the opposite, hog, and if the internal moment exceeds design limits, the keel could fail. That's the classic beam formula for bending moment, where W is the distributed weight per metre, and L is the unsupported length. It's an approximation, but one that designers take seriously, especially for longer vessels. To hold all that back, a mechanical trigger, or release pin, keeps the cradle locked in place until the final moment. It's backed up with secondary safeties because once it's pulled, the ship is committed. 
The cradle slides, the hull groans, and in a few long seconds, steel leaves land and meets the sea. Once enough of the hull is submerged, buoyancy takes over. The ship floats. The cradle halts. Drag chains or sea anchors might be used to slow the motion, keeping it from overshooting into deeper waters. In some shipyards, all of this is mechanised. The vessel is launched on a marine railway, lowered by cables, pulleys and winding engines. Still, this method demands space. You need enough length to slide a full ship straight into the sea, and when the yard doesn't have that luxury, well then, you rotate the ship sideways, and everything changes. When the water runs narrow and space is tight, end-on launching just isn't an option. There's no room for a ship to roll straight backward, so shipbuilders turn the vessel 90 degrees and launch it sideways. At first glance, it looks dramatic, almost violent. A wall of water erupts, the hull crashes down, rolling dangerously before it finds equilibrium. But like everything else in shipbuilding, it's controlled, calculated chaos. Side launching is common along rivers and inland waterways, where shipyards lie parallel to the shoreline. Instead of launching down a lengthwise slope, the ship rests on transverse tracks, rails that run perpendicular to the shore. Once released, the vessel slides sideways into the water, sometimes helped by grease, hydraulic jacks or sheer mechanical force. But this sideways drop unleashes a whole new class of forces. Because when a ship rolls even briefly, the hull bends, and that bending moment can be intense. Bending moment is the force trying to curve or twist the structure and is calculated as m equals to w multiplied by x multiplied by open bracket l minus x close bracket divided by 2. <laughs> it's a mouthful, but it's an important equation. w is the distributed load, force per unit length. X is the distance from the nearest support point, and L is the total length between supports. The greatest stress usually strikes the midpoint, especially if the ship's weight isn't evenly distributed. But that's just the start. As the hull hits water, the bilge area, the curved section at the bottom sides of the ship, slams into the surface. The slamming impact creates hydrodynamic pressure. Engineers estimate it using simplified forms of the von Karaman equation where P is the impact pressure, rho is the water density, and V is the velocity at water entry. Too high and local deformation or even denting can occur. And then there's the risk of asymmetric flooding, where one side of the hull fills with water faster than the other during launch. To counter this, shipbuilders reinforce the hull with transverse framing, a rib-like internal structure that resists these dynamic loads. In some cases, drag chains or counterweights are attached, not to stop the launch, but to slow the momentum and limit the roll. Not all launches involve sliding or splashing. In fact, some of the biggest, most expensive vessels in the world don't launch at all. They float out. This method is as calm as it is controlled. Float-out launching happens inside a dry dock, a massive watertight basin where the ship is built directly on blocks. The hull takes shape slowly, piece by piece, with cranes and scaffolding surrounding it like an exoskeleton. When the time comes, dock gates are opened and seawater floods in. Pumps are turned off. Buoyancy does the rest. Bit by bit, the hull lifts from supports, floating gently for the first time. And because everything happens so slowly, engineers can monitor the ship's buoyancy, trim and stability in real time. That's why float-out is the preferred method for cruise ships, naval vessels and any project where risk is unacceptable. With a controlled environment, sensitive systems can already be in place. Before float-out, every opening in the hull must be sealed watertight. Ballast plans are checked and rechecked, and tugboats stand ready outside the dock to guide the newborn vessel out to sea. But what if you don't have a dry dock? Just open ground and an unfinished ship? you improvise. It might sound like science fiction, but yes, some ships are launched using giant rubber balloons. This is airbag launching, also called the marine balloon method. As the ship nears completion, a series of long, cylindrical airbags, typically made of a rubber and heavy-duty synthetic tire cord layers, are placed underneath the hull, evenly spaced and deflated. Once secured, they gradually inflate with high-pressure air, lifting the ship off its blocks. 
When the weight comes down, the airbag compresses, flattens and distributes the load evenly across its surface. Then slowly, the airbags are allowed to rotate and roll downhill, carrying the ship toward the sea like an enormous conveyor belt. A single industrial airbag, properly inflated, can support hundreds of tonnes. Engineers calculate the load-bearing force as pressure multiplied by contact area. If the pressure is too low, the hull sinks too far and risks grounding. Too high and the rubber shell could rupture under stress. That's why most airbags operate within a tight range, around 0.2 to 0.6 megapascals, carefully monitored throughout the launch. But one airbag isn't enough. The ship's total launching weight is divided among all the rollers. 10 airbags might be rolling a 3,000 ton ship. That's 300 tons of load each, while the vessel shifts from dry land to open sea. And as the ship rolls, speed matters. Too slow and the airbag deformation becomes uneven. Too fast and control is lost. The entire process is kept under 0.3 meters per second, slower than a casual walk, but every moment must be watched. And then at the shoreline, the waterline creeps up the hull and the weight begins to lift. That's buoyancy taking over, the upward force defined by Archimedes' principle. The deeper the hull sinks, the greater the displaced volume and the stronger the lift. When buoyancy equals weight, the ship floats. The airbags no longer carry the load and their job is over. Airbag launching is cheap, reusable and flexible enough to launch in areas where traditional shipyards would never fit. It's mostly used for fishing boats, tugboats, barges and even some small cargo ships up to several thousand tonnes. And once it's over, the same airbags are deflated, rolled up and stored, ready to lift the next one. In modern shipyards where space is tight or where vessels need to be launched and retrieved repeatedly, sliding down a ramp just isn't practical. That's where the synchro lift comes in. Picture a massive steel platform, large enough to cradle an entire ship sitting just beneath the water's surface. Beneath it, a network of synchronised hoists, often dozens, work in perfect unison. When a vessel is ready, it's moved onto the platform using rails or self-propelled transporters. Then, with a push of a button, the synchro lift lowers, slowly, evenly, dipping the vessel into the water like a tea bag into a cup. And it doesn't just launch ships, it recovers them too. The same platform can be raised again to lift a vessel out of the sea for repairs or dry work, transforming the synchro lift from a launch system into a flexible dry dock. This vertical movement eliminates the need for slipways and avoids the dynamic stresses of sliding launches. But the system demands absolute synchronization. Even a few millimetres of tilt can strain a hull unevenly or warp structural components. That's why sensors, load monitors and backup systems are built into every hoist. For modular shipyards, where hulls are built in sections and assembled like Lego on the platform, the synchro lift isn't just a launch system, it's the heart of production. But launching is just the beginning. Tugboats secure her flanks, mooring lines stretch taut, and shipyard workers swarm the deck, inspecting welds, measuring trim and checking for leaks. Once afloat, the ship enters a new phase, outfitting. Cranes return, welders climb aboard, pipes are laid, engines aligned, interiors assembled. After that come the tests. Harbour trials check her systems at the dock. Sea trials? They're still weeks, sometimes months away. First, the vessel has to be completed and inspected. Only then, after months of work, is she delivered, christened and finally ready to serve. That's how you launch a ship. Every episode on this channel takes days to produce. From research and scripting to storyboarding, animation and even voiceover. And it's all made possible by our Patreon crew. We've just revamped our Patreon and we've prepared a lot more to share with you. As a deckhand, you'll get early ad-free access to new videos, be able to vote on upcoming video topics, grab exclusive wallpapers for your phone and PC, and see your name on our supporters wall at the end of every new video. If you'd like a closer look behind the scenes, the officer tier gives you time lapses of our team working hard on brand new animations or thumbnails. You'll also get behind the scenes updates, animatic releases and a monthly newsletter filled with maritime stories and news that we don't cover on the channel. 
And for those who really want to take the helm, our captain tier lets you sail your very own custom-designed ship in the casual navigation art style, featured in a future episode for everyone to see. You'll also get your name in the end credits as a captain supporter, with video shoutouts and private Q&A sessions on Discord. However you choose to support, or even if you're just here watching, it truly means a lot. You'll find the Patreon link down below. Thank you for keeping casual navigation afloat.